Hello everyone, time for Friday First Chapters. I have four older books today, um, two early chapter books and two advanced chapter books. And the first one I'm going to read is called The, the Top Secret, The Unbelievable Top Secret Diary of Pig. This is me, I is Pig by Emmer Stamp. His grammar's not that great. These are older books. I'm waiting for a new book order to come in, but hey, there are lots of good older books. Me, I is pig. I is 465 sunsets old, but every day I gets older. So this fact is only correct right now on the day I is writing. I live in pig house. Pig house is next to chicken house, which is across from cow shed, which is not too far from duck pond. I has drawn a map for you. Let's see. This is the old hay barn. This is the new barn. This is chicken house. This is pig house and this is cow shed. A very little farm, I think. I is the only pig that lives here. I has only ever been called pig, so pig is my name. I is a very lucky pig. Of all the animals in the yard, I think that farmer thinks that farmer loves me most because he is always giving me lots of yummy slops and lots of special back scratches. I love back scratches, but most of all, I loves yummy slops. Yummy, sloppy food. I loves my food. I dream about food a lot. Mushy parsnips and mashed up carrots, sloppy potatoes. See, when I get going, it's all I can think about. And here's a picture. This is me. I is pig. Anyways, what I bet you is wondering is what is a pig doing writing a diary? Well, it's simple, really. I often go sniffing around the garbage cans that farmers, that farmer leaves out by my, by the main gate. I go snuffling in them to see if I can find more slops. But today I didn't find no slops or scraps. I found this little book in a very chewed old pen. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be fun to keep a diary? I is not sure who will be reading this diary, but I is thinking whoever you is, you must be a very clever because you can read pig. Or maybe you is a pig too. Who knows? Anyways, here goes. And here we go. Day one. Oh wait, the book is a scholastic press book. Day one. I has no idea what to call this day. So as it is the first day I is writing this diary, I will call it day one. And then it will be simple after that. You will see. Hello. Today I is very happy. Farmer gave me two big dollops of slops. I ate them very fast and they made me windy. Farmer let me out into the yard. So I went straight over towards the chicken house and laid some big fat farts right next to it. I is really not liking chickens. They is evil. I is sure if you was to meet them, you would think they is evil too. Evil chickens is evil because, one, I is not looking they sticks their evil beaks into my bowl and eats my slops. If I shouts at them to stop, they pecks me on my head. They has nasty, sharp, evil beaks and it hurts. Two, when cow lies down to sleep, they hops on her back and does little poos all over. So here's some different pictures. Showing what pig is talking about. All over her, they think this is very funny. I think this is very nasty. I wish cow wasn't so nice and would poo on them. Three, they steals my friend Duck's special duck food. Farmer gives it to him in a bowl. But as soon as Farmer isn't looking, the evil chickens push Duck out of the way and eat it. Duck pretends that he doesn't care, but I know deep inside he does. 
The, four, they has nasty, evil little eyes. They is very black, like little dark holes that is made of pure evil. I is not locking their evil little eyes. They makes me feel scared just looking at them. Once I had finished stinking up the chicken house, I went over to see Duck. Duck is great. Duck is very, very, likes me, Duck. I likes Duck very, very much. If you met Duck, I knows you would like him too. There used to be more than one duck, but one night Fox came and ate them all up. Fox ate Duck's mom, his dad, and all his brothers and sisters, and Fox is very nasty. He made ducks very sad. Fox liked to eat hens and ducks. I knows what it is like not to have a mom or dad or brothers and sisters because I got taken away from mine when I was very little and brought here to live with Farmer. So I made an extra special effort to cheer Duck up. Me and Duck is best friends now. Duck says I, like, I is like a brother, only I don't have feathers or funny flappy feet. Ha <laughs> ha, Duck always makes me laugh. Duck lives in a little shed in the middle of Duck Pond. That way Fox can't get him, cause Fox can't swim. Ha ha, Mr. Fox is not so clever now. Duck is very clever. He speaks lots of languages. He speaks pig, chicken, cow, sheep, and farmer. This is much better than I can do. I can only speak duck. It's a lot like pig. Just listen to the noise of a duck talking and the noise of a pig talking and you will seize what I mean. And I speaks a little bit of cow and sheep. I can't speak any farmer, but I can understand a teensy weensy bit if I listens really hard and concentrates. I hope that you can read pig, otherwise you won't be able to understand a word that I is writing. <laughs> I can't swim, so I sits on the side with my trotters in the mud and waits for ducks to come over. Today, Duck told me that he thinks the evil chickens are planning something. He says that last night they were up very late in the chicken house, way past lights out. He said they didn't come and steal his food today either, which means they must be up to something because they always make time to steal food. Duck told me I should eat less. He says that way I will live longer. But I says if I don't eat so much, then I will shrink right down and be a mini pig. Duck says, if I is small, farmer will keep me longer. But farmer is very happy when I eat. Duck is silly sometimes. At the end of the day, farmer came and put me back into pig house. He gave me one of his special back scratches and made a very happy noise. Farmer likes me big. Duck is so wrong. I is going to make myself as big as I can. That way, Farmer will love me more. And there he is, dreaming about food. Day two. So if you want to find out what Farmer's going to do with Pig and what's going to happen with Duck and the others, you'll have to check the book out. The second early chapter book I have is called The Middle Kid. How many of you are a middle kid? I am the youngest of the family. And my sister and brother always said, Mom and Dad liked you best. It's not true. All parents love every one of their kids best. But this one's about being a middle kid by Steven Weinberg. Not fair. Life as a middle kid is no picnic. It's always you who gets in trouble, you who gets picked on, always your popsicle that gets knocked to the ground. Oh well, at least you can sit and draw in some peace. And never mind, they got orange juice all over your art. Why is being a middle kid always the worst? With equal parts humor and sincerity, Steven Weinberg draws a picture of the fun and the fray of life as a middle kid struggles to hold his own in the family. Never the first or last, tallest or smallest, never the, f never, but always in between, they couldn't possibly be anything good about being in the middle. Could there?
The book is a chronicle book. Chapter 1. Good morning. Today, this year. Dear you, this is a book about me, the middle kid. You might ask, hey, what is a middle kid? Well, a middle kid is the one who gets blamed when your little sister is crying, the one who gets beat up, beat, who gets beat up when your big brother is mad. Not the youngest, not the oldest, somewhere in the middle. Me, sometimes I hate it. Sometimes I love it. This book is a day in my life. Good luck. Right in between. The middle kid. The alarm's going off at 6.59 a.m. Snore, sniffle, wah, snore, snore, <laughs> snore. Good morning. And that is how I wake up today. Seven twenty six AM <laughs> Chapter two. I will read two chapters. That's really short. I should have looked ahead. Pass the OJ. I hey, I said pass the OJ. I am drawing. I love drawing. Drawing is the only time no one tells me that I am too loud. Orange juice. I want more milk, mommy. I want the milk, says the younger sister. I am drawing a castle. It has two big towers, strong walls, and a moat with tigers. Castles need to be super strong. They are always getting attacked. Fine, I will grab it myself. See what I mean? Attack from both sides. The life of a kid in the middle. Mom! There's the orange juice all over everything. Almost like a graphic novel. There's so many pictures in this one. I'll read one more chapter. They are so short. Chapter three, you gotta be tough. This morning, my big brother tells me, you gotta be tough. I am, I yell. No, he says, you are loud. Loud is not tough. I turn around. I have things to draw. He grabs my shoulder and said, I will teach you how to be tough because I am tough and I have your back. That might be the nicest thing he has ever told me. Then he stops looking so nice. He says, come with me. I am not tough yet, so I do not say no. That is a kind of a scary look, is it not? This is Grandma's truck, says my big brother, pointing to a scary old box. Oh, a trunk. A trunk is like a box that locks. It is very safe. I know what a trunk is, I tell him, but I have never seen one before. Like I was saying, he says, you are not tough, but you gotta be. This trunk will make you tough. I can do a pull-up. It is my job to feed the class snake. I want to draw. <coughs> Excuse me, please. But my big brother isn't listening. He's too busy being tough. Uh-oh. You never, ever put anybody in a trunk. He's too tough. Let me out! Ten fifty a.m. Chapter four. Bungee jumping. As you can see, he's pretty picked on. So if you want to know what it's like to be the middle kid, and maybe be a little nicer to your siblings, you might want to check this book out and find out what happens. For our older, more advanced chapter book readers, I have this isn't even that hard. Stick Cat by Tom Watson. Also, he's the author of Stick Dog, A Tale of Two Kitties. There is a new pet in town and it's called Stick Cat. It is a big day in the big city of, for Stick Cat and his best friend, Edith. 
There are treasures to hunt, songs to see, pigeons to catch, and naps to take. But way up on the 23rd floor, danger look, lurks just around the corner. Terrible noises and violent crashes trap a desperate man in the building next door. Stick Cat will need to navigate his way across the alley and around Edith's peculiar ways to attempt a rescue. With Tom Watson's trademark combination of laughs and adventure, Stick Cat's high wire act is sure to please cat lovers and stick dog fans everywhere. It's a Harper Collins book. So this is a series, just like Stick Dog, and it's got quite a few illustrations in it. So if you're into um, books that still have lots of illustrations, you want to read something like this. Chapter one, remember our deal? Do you remember our deal from the Stick Dog books? You know, how you're not allowed to hassle me about my drawing skills and stuff, and how I am allowed to go off in other directions now and then. I'm glad you remember because I have a bit of a situation here. I need to go off in a, in a way different direction. And here's the new deal. And it's Mary's fault. Who's Mary? Good question. Let me just tell you, you how this all got started. Mary Cunningham walked by my desk on the way to the pencil sharpener yesterday. Here's a picture of Mary. She paused for a second at my desk and said, hi. It was weird. She had never said hi to me before. It was right in the middle of Miss Griffin's English class. I was about to get cranking on a new stick dog story. It was pretty much my favorite part of every school day. Mary sharpened her pencil and returned to her seat. One minute later, the super weird stuff began. Mary came back. This was her second trip to the pencil sharpener. Only this time, she didn't just pause at my desk, she stopped. I know you probably think I'm making this up, but I'm not, I swear. She actually stopped. Mary tapped her pencil on my composition book as she stood there right next to me. Her pencil had a little rubber eraser on it. It jiggled with each cat. And what do you see on that rubber eraser? A cat. She has cat everything. Her folders and book covers have cats on them. She has cat sweaters and pencils and socks. I've noticed her talking a lot about her cats, Francis and Nora. Can I tell you something weird? I don't know how it happened or when it happened, but something occurred last week or last month or whenever, and now girls are a lot less annoying and a lot more, you know, interesting. And Mary is more interesting than any other girl in my class. She stopped tapping her pencil and looked at me. The little orange and white cat eraser wobbled an extra couple of seconds after the pencil stopped moving. Mary stood real close on the left side of my desk. It started to get warm in class for some reason. I wondered if maybe Miss Griffin should open a window. Are you working on another stick dog story, Mary asked. I nodded. What kind of food will they discover this time? I'm thinking about candy, I answered. A Halloween story, maybe. Fun idea. Okay, this was more than a walking by my desk on the way to the pencil sharpener comment. This was an official conversation. I said, I think it could be really funny if they follow two kids around the neighborhood on Halloween. And maybe they get all, the, all freaked out by the costumes and stuff. That's when Mary did this really cool thing. She laughed. You should do a story about cats, she suggested. I have cats. Yeah, maybe. I didn't know what else to say. I like, I'd like to read it if you do. And then she left. I only said one thing after Mary sat down at her desk. Ms. Griffin, I called. Can I open a window? It's really warm in here. And there is her thinking about a cat book.
Chapter 2, Stick, Cat, and Goose. So he is going to write a book about a cat, and that is why this book is called Stick Cat, the first of another series. I think you will enjoy them. And my last book is called The Collectors. Original, brave, and addictive, Adam Gidwitz says. He's a Newbery Honor author. It is by Jacqueline West. Look closely. Do you see that marble in the grass? The tiny astronaut with one arm raised, the old-fashioned key in the gutter. Van sees them. Van notices all sorts of things, but usually no one notices Van. He's small, and he's always looking, and he's always the new kid, easy to overlook. Then one day he watches a mysterious girl and a silver squirrel dive into a fountain to steal a coin. And even more strange, they notice Van. Suddenly the world changes for Van. It becomes a place where wishes are real, a place where wishes can be collected, just like his little treasures, a place where wishes can come true. But that's not always a good thing. Not all good wishes are good. You see, and even good wishes can have unintended consequences. And Van is about to find out just how big those consequences can be. Okay. It's a Green Willow book. Chapter 1, Small Things. The spider dangled above the table. It was a large table in a busy restaurant, but it was wedged into the dimmest corner and the spider's web was strung between the curls of an old wrought iron chandelier that no one ever remembered to dust. A family sat at the table now. Three grandparents, an aunt and an uncle, a mother and a father, and a child who was exactly four years old. The spider positioned herself above the child's chair. She waited there, watching her eyes glittering like bumps on a wet blackberry. When several waiters trooped into the corner, carrying a special little cake with four burning candles on the top, the spider inched a little bit further toward her thread. Down her thread. The waiters and family all sang and cheered. Make a wish, said one of the grandmothers. The child huffed out the candles. Everyone cheered again. And in that moment, while everyone was smiling and clapping and getting ready to slice the cake, something rose up into the air on a spinning wisp of candle smoke. The spider caught it. It was what she had been waiting for. She bundled it up into a, small, into a ball of strong, gluey thread. And then she scuttled across the ceiling to the nearest window and wedged herself through the gap above the sill, dragging the bundle behind her. Outside, a gust of cool evening air swept over her, making her clutch the restaurant's brick wall with six legs. But she didn't lose her grip on the bundle. Once the gust had passed, she lowered it slowly, carefully toward the sidewalk. A gray pigeon hopped down from its perch on the street sign. It glided below the restaurant window, snipped the spider's thread with its beak, and flapped away up the twilight street. The bundle dangling under like a tiny broken pendulum. The pigeon landed on the shoulder of a woman in a long black coat. The woman held up one hand. The pigeon dropped the bundle into it. The woman tucked the bundle safely into one of the coat's many pockets. Then the woman turned and strode off into the shadows with the pigeon still perching on her shoulder and the spider squeezed back through the window gap, and nobody noticed the small, strange, terribly important thing that had just happened. That's the thing about small things. They're very easy to miss. This makes small things dangerous. Germs, thumbtacks, spiders, both the black widow that lurks under rotting wood piles and the patient, watchful ones that live in the chandeliers of old Italian restaurants.
Most of us don't spot them until it's too late. So it's a good thing for us that someone else, someone quiet and sharp-eyed and also very easy to miss, is always keeping watch. Chapter 2, A Damp Squirrel. That starts off a little bit spooky, I think. It's got a very nice cover. So that is it today, my, my friends. And if you're interested in any one of them, you can come in and check them out at our library. Thanks for joining me. Goodbye for now.